The presentation is in Turkish, but don't worry, I'll be delivering it in English. So don't worry about that. Okay. So let's start with this one. And then I would like to talk a little bit about like applications of NFTs, the way we use them. And then after a brief introduction, I want to, to uh, show you how we are building NFTs from a, a solidity perspective, smart contracts perspective, and then how we interact with them and what are the little details we, uh, we pay attention to. So the, uh, the most important part of NFTs is actually tokenization. So, um, the way we are dealing with uh, monkey pictures and then like profile pictures and open C and blur, we are actually experimenting on identifying uh, non-fungible uh, tokens, unique things that identify real world assets or digital assets, and then see how we can trade them. And then there are little details we learn going along, what works and what doesn't work. And uh, these synthetic um, uh, assets uh, similar to like watches or like bags, Gucci bags, uh, our profile pictures give us an uh, excellent uh, venue to understand uh, what works, how humans uh, react to it, uh, how markets react to it, and technically how we should represent them. And then there has been quite some improvement in the last few years, and then we are looking forward to seeing more with the regulation coming up. But basically, we are representing some a unique uh, asset. And then these are digital ownership certificates of these assets. These assets can be like houses, just like in real estate. They can be um, car uh, uh, licenses. So you can buy and sell your car. These can be shares of a company. Uh, we'll look at it in uh, in the game five section. These can be uh, uh, game assets, like, like a character or an item or something. But uh, basically, they are unique items most of the time. And then uh, we can identify them and then we can trade them. So that's the, that's the motive behind it. And if you look at uh, houses, for example, you can just split a house in 1,000 pieces, similar to a company. But then you might say like, oh, which part is mine? It's like my part closer to the window. Is it my part closer to the balcony? So then uh, you might have to uh, say like, okay, basically you have 1,000 of this house, but not really uh, a specific portion of the house. So it might not be unique. It might be still 1,000 piece of, uh, of house here, uh, different from another house or like another building, but in itself, it would be fungible. So those are the two types of NFTs currently we are uh, using. And then we have also like one more type, where we give something to someone, but we prevent them from trading it. And then we call them non-transferable tokens. This could be, your, for example, your diploma. So you study in a school and you earn something and you can prove it to the others, but we wouldn't want you to sell it or transfer it to someone. So bird certificates, stuff like that. Those also can be represented with NFTs. And then they're like the, the third class. They're like a record, uh, but then still, in itself, uh, we can identify that they are similar. So my birth certificate would be uh, Sabri Hoca's birth certificate in Turkey. There are still Turkish birth certificates given in a particular year. So we still can compare them, but we won't we be able to trade them or sell them among ourselves, okay? So GameFi, as I said, uh, is a perfect entrance point for this because we are creating digital assets, things that did not exist before. And then typically we have um, uh, we have digital tokens like gold and jewelry if you're used to, to playing uh, games. And then we can sell these assets with these imaginary tokens, okay? So for these houses, the government says, uh, most governments say, oh, you have to have my permission. You cannot simply tokenize a house. This has to be regulated, okay? But for gaming assets, since they're all imaginary, okay, and then they are not really regulated, uh, it's very easy to do this. And then this is a very good entry point for NFTs, also digital art, generative art, or uh, profile pictures. So they were the early uh, versions. But then if you look at the history of NFTs, uh, one of the very successful early NFTs was something called CryptoKitties. Uh, this was a game on the Ethereum platform and which allowed you to breed digital kittens and then you could sell them, etc. Similar to the Pokemon game, you can think of it that way. 
And uh, so they are very fit uh, for this particular task. And now around these assets, like a, a character or an item that we can use, what we're doing is like we're building these marketplaces. OpenSea is one of them, Blur is uh, one of them, Rarible, there are so many others where you can buy and sell and trade these assets. And then the way they should look like uh, is designed by experience. So people are experimenting how they should look like, how you should interact with it, what works. And then once they're ready, so uh, they're almost ready. They're like very, uh, very well, widely used. So they will be applied to uh, they will be applied to uh, houses as well. So once the the OpenSea is uh, usable for all kinds of profile pictures, then it will start using it for houses. Then it will start using it for um, um, stock options or like debt, all kinds of financial uh, instruments which are called securities. Okay, so securities are those things where you either have like some governance, right? You can manage the company, they pay you dividends, they pay you some money per month, or it's based on some real world asset. And then when we talk about securities, typically these companies, uh, these institutions in Turkey, we call them SPK, in US it's called SEC, Germany, Buffin, whatever. So these institutions make sure investors are well protected. So they do not allow you randomly uh, tokenize a house or like tokenize a car, tokenize a parking spot. So you have to have some regulations around it. But as we move forward uh, with blockchain technology, it will become much more easier to do those things. And this is a game we're working on these days. And so basically, as I said, there, is, there are these playable characters. You can rent them even, not only uh, buy and sell, so some guy buys this character, plays along with it for some time, uh, upgrades it, brings it to some high level, and then you just don't want to waste your time with this. So this is called grinding in gaming, where you have to spend lots of time improving the character. It might not be like super fun to do that, but then there is a sweet spot uh, in the evolution of the character where it is like really fun to play, and then it's not like super hard or not super easy. Okay, somewhere in between. And then you might want to rent the character at that level, just pay a small fee, play the game, and then return the character to the owner who can rent it to some, someone else. So in that case, uh, NFTs will play a great role. And there are all these items you can apply to them. So there are game dynamics like uh, improving a character, merging two characters, or merging an item and a character, uh, as I said, buying and uh, renting. And then these are all also applicable to uh, other NFTs like houses. So you can rent a house, uh, you can upgrade it uh, with, with other uh, items or things. And then those can be uh, applied in real life, uh, similar to like a farming game maybe. So you can rent uh, a, a business property, ask the, uh, the operator to install, I don't know, networking or whatever, and then uh, pay for it. And in the end, you receive a, an office with network connection, that type of thing. So that's something that will happen in the very near future. But then how do we do those things? So probably you've talked about this concept of smart contracts. So what we do is we need a platform to run these things. Okay, so we need a place where we can build our NFTs. And then mainly uh, we need some sort of distributed ledger to do it. Uh, it's just like a database, it's like a public database. But with this public database, we are also able to uh, record these ownership assets and then program them. So this programmability is the, is the most important part of uh, NFT. So you can do lots of stuff with them, just like for example, renting. Uh, so you rent the, the NFT, you play the game with it, and then uh, the, uh, the profits you earn from the NFT, 60% go to the player, 40% go to the owner, for example. So you can program those things the way you do it like a lease. And uh, smart contract concept is very similar to a vending machine. So it's, it's public, so you can see it. Uh, you can uh, put some goods in here, like chocolate or whatever, and some person can come and then look at your machine, look at the, the prices, and then, for example, let's say crunch, and let's say that's like a single dollar. Uh, you can just put in five quarters, uh, it will return one quarter. If you put in three quarters, it will still expect the fourth quarter from you. 
And then uh, once you get your crunch, once you just put in your $1 and get your crunch, uh, there's no way for you to put the crunch back in and get your money back. Okay, it doesn't work that way. It's like a one-way transaction. So you just figure out what's going on. You just put in your money and you get your stuff back. And then it's not that the, 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 there is no operator and the machine does not uh, differentiate between people. You cannot say like, oh, dude, I have like three quarters. Would you allow me to have my chocolate and I can pay you back tomorrow? That won't work. Uh, so the, the machine cannot look at you and then say like, oh, you're a tourist. Uh, let me charge you a uh, dollar and another quarter for the crunch. That also doesn't work. Prices are fixed for everyone. Everyone can monitor this machine. And then there's one more property of smart contracts. We can also see uh, all the transactions of this machine. So we can observe this machine and see who is buying uh, what kind of uh, chocolate and how much money they're paying. That's also transparent. So everybody can, can look at this one. And then this, this uh, idea, we're gonna apply to a, pro a program and then we're gonna make it available for our NFTs or like for our goods and assets. And we'll have a look at that one. But then before we go into um, smart contracts, we have to look at like regular contracts. How do regular contracts behave? This is usually like a written document. So you have some sort of document where um, you have uh, two parties. One party is usually like a person. The other can be another person or can be an institution. Uh, it can even be between institutions and it usually involves an object, something. So say you're hiring, uh, say you're renting a house, okay? So somebody owns a, uh, somebody owns a, um, yeah. So Sabroj also mentioned it. Just save your questions. I will just like briefly pause and get your questions as we are moving between things and then I'll be happy to answer them. So uh, you have uh, a renting contract, okay? So it involves a house or a property. There is a landlord, some person owns it and the other person wants to use it for a period of time and pay some money for it, okay? You just prepare your document written in English or in Turkish, whatever, and then you might get the help of an expert, a lawyer, uh, who can uh, uh, create this document for you. And if there is a conflict between you guys, you go to the court. And once you go to the court, uh, another person, the judge will decide if there are uh, conflicts, there are violations, and then usually uh, if things work out well, nobody does anything. If things don't work out well, the document describes what should be done. That is the punishment for it. If you don't pay me your rent, this will happen. And then, uh, so usually the judge has very limited understanding of the world around him or her. So uh, he or she cannot uh, look at the, the world, so needs an expert, which we call Oracle in our um, smart contract world. So say the conflict is about using the property for um, uh, accommodation or business. Okay, so are you going to live there or are you going to make it into a barbershop? And you rented the place as, as a house and now you're running a barbershop there. The landlord is pissed off and then he's taking the matter to the court. Okay, The judge orders the oracle to uh, figure out if you use it as accommodation or business. Okay, He cannot or she cannot figure it out by herself or himself. Okay? Also, uh, if the judge decides to uh, remove you from the house, the judge cannot do it uh, on its own. Okay, that doesn't work. So uh, the judge needs the, the police force to do that. So that's an external force that looks at the results of the blockchain and acts upon it. We have similar uh, thing in, in, in law, but also with blockchains. The blockchain is a record and then the blockchain cannot do things for you. But then it can explicitly say, oh, this has to be done. And then third parties can act on it. So based on the program, uh, the, the blockchain or the judge will decide and then uh, it acts. And then we have very similar stuff happening with our computer programs, which we call smart contracts. So we just deploy a program on the uh, on a platform, on a uh, smart contract platform. You might, you, they usually use the blockchain. And then uh, the program is usually public. So we can look at its code, figure out what it will do before even we interact with it. People can audit it. People can read the code and say like, oh, this is gonna happen. 
Uh, so this is solid. There are no issues with that. So it's transparent. As soon as somebody interacts with it, uh, you can see the interaction. It's irreversible. So once you have a smart contract and you deposit some money into it, uh, a result comes out, but the result cannot be reversed. Okay. So it's connected to other uh, smart contracts, leaves a track, and these are autonomous programs, very similar to a website. So what is a website? A website is a program that runs on a web server. So you just give electricity, an internet connection to the computer, and as soon as somebody arrives, it displays a website. And then it does this uh, 724 uninterrupted without uh, taking orders. Smart contracts behave the same. So it's a program very similar to the vending machine. As soon as you interact with it, it does what it's supposed to do, collect some money usually, and then it can store money. And then also it can transfer this money to, to some other contract or some other user, the owner of it. Think of the vending machine. The vending machine collects those coins. You can come and collect it. And these new vending machines we have in our schools now accept credit card payments. As soon as you pay the machine, the money goes to your account. And the money doesn't stay in there, but then basically the the, money, the machine was able to transfer this machine uh, the money to you. So it's a, a very useful um, uh, apparition which we use for trading stuff. Here is here is like a very simple uh, example I like. It's one one of very early examples. This is an I think she's Irish singer. Uh, her name is Imogen Heap. and then she released her album Tiny Human on the Ethereum blockchain. Okay, with smart contract. And then here you can see all the interactions uh, between people, users, and her, where people are buying uh, the song. And they paid an amount of uh, money, like the, the native token of that uh, blockchain platform called Ether. And then there is a time record here. So these blockchains work in time uh, uh, units called blocks. Every few uh, seconds or with, uh, with Bitcoin, every few minutes, there is a block. And once you have a block, uh, records are uh, put into there and they're considered permanent. And so you can download the song by paying this amount. This is nice. So we do it with other uh, platforms as well, with Spotify or something else where we are buying songs. Here is the interesting part. The smart contract says 90% um, of the money will go to Imogen Deep. Okay. 5% will go to the bass player, 3% will go to the, uh, the, the guitar player, 2% will go to the drummer, okay? And they've set it up in the beginning, okay? So uh, you cannot change it. If Imogen Heap gets pissed off with the drummer, she cannot change it. And the drummer cannot demand more than 2% afterwards, okay? It's all set in stone. And then as the user, if you agree with this, this setup, you give them this uh, amount, and this amount is distributed uh, uh, among the addresses uh, that are eligible to receive these payments. So Imogen receives some, drummer receives some. And then as long as they have the keys, uh, not only the drummer, but maybe the drummer's children can benefit from it, or wife, or whatever, or partner. So uh, it's also possible to transfer the ownership of the address. And then uh, these royalties, you might call these, the, these royalties, are still transferred to, to next of kin. So it's a nice, nice setup. And as long as people are buying the song, maybe 30 years from now, uh, as long as there's somebody to receive the money on the other side, users can just buy this and then transfer this wealth. And then the other party can just convert it to some, uh, some um, fiat money or like some known token and they use it to purchase uh, basic goods. Okay, so it's a very good example of, of a vending machine applied to uh, digital arts or uh, intellectual property. And then it's, it's a programmable way of distributing this, uh, these funds. Now, do you have questions about this first part of the presentation? So about like NFTs in general, their use cases, and then the way we are using smart contracts, because now I'm going to proceed with on how to build uh, a smart contract and how to make an NFT. Questions? Let's see if uh, anybody has any questions. It's it's also like, I think uh, Ismail Oja covered some of these topics. I'll yes. briefly yes. Uh, show them how it's done uh, through the NFT. But in, in terms of smart contract, I think um, like 
the, the percentages are described in the smart contract. And when somebody makes a transaction, you also pay a small fee for the, um, I guess the transaction to go through this called gas fee. Yes. Uh, and that's like added on top of the cost of the product you're buying. And then inside of the smart contract, these uh, these wallet addresses, uh, like the drummer, the musicians, and Im Imogen Heap, in this case, the, the songwriters, it, it, they have designated percentages that it's tied to the smart contract. And you, you cannot actually change that smart contract once it's uploaded to the blockchain, right? There's no way of going around with it. Yeah, some of it we can change, okay? But then uh, this is usually very undesired from the buyer's perspective or the seller's perspective. But for example, if the, the, the royalty percentage is, is adjustable, uh, you can say like going forward, you're gonna change it from 10% to 6%, there's a discount, or you can say we are just bring it back to 10%, but all these transactions are observable. And then for practicality, people make some of the contracts uh, changeable, but you don't like it as much. So if it is, uh, if it doesn't change at all, uh, there are benefits of that because we are trying to build trust without uh, third parties. So if the computer program is also changing, people don't trust that. So if at least the computer program is always fixed, that's a way of uh, building trust with that. Okay. So okay. then let's proceed with building uh, an NFT, how we do it. Okay. And I'll show you like a very easy way of uh, doing it. So you can, you can start uh, learning about this one and then we'll go into more details. So we have a library called Open Zeppelin. You might have heard of it. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a, let's say institution that builds high quality uh, solidity uh, libraries that we can use. And then they also offer um, uh, auditing services. So you just prepare a smart contract and you can ask them if something's wrong with it. That's how they make money. But the, the good thing is uh, all their code has been reviewed many times. So lots of people look at their code and comment and it's open source. So uh, things we built with uh, Open Zeppelin's libraries, we usually trust. Okay, so that's the good thing about that. They have something called the Open Zeppelin Wizard, where you can very easily, without knowing much, you can build a Solidity code, uh, which will help you do stuff. And then uh, you can also do NFTs here. And then, as I mentioned, there are two types of NFTs, which we generally use. One of them is called a 721, and the other one is called an 1155. The 721 is for unique things, okay? So a human being, so we can uh, uniquely identify a human being with an NFT. If you wanna do something like that, that's the place to go. If you wanna do stocks, uh, if you wanna uh, tokenize a house, that's these are the ones we use, 1155s. And then you can have 10,000 uh, shares of a company, company A, and 10,000 shares of company B. You can trade the, the, the stocks of company A in itself, Okay, so five stocks versus another five stock, you can exchange them, but you don't necessarily can exchange stock of A versus stock of B. You have to just value it. And this is the term fungibility. If you can exchange something, there is no difference between two units. We call them fungible, undifferentiable uh, things. For example, coins, like single lira coins. If you look at them, they're the same. Okay, they're made of metal, there are no serial numbers, there is no way to uh, differentiate them. So you can just take one coin and give the other one without any problem. But you cannot do the same thing uh, with, I don't know, um, for example, a, a, a painting. So you cannot simply exchange paintings. There has to be some valuation, and then they're usually they're different in value. So you might need some other uh, token, to measure their value and then say like, this is like $5 million, $3 million. Here we exchange the pictures and you give me $2 million in difference, okay? So, but we're first, we're gonna look at the uh, first version 721. And then we're gonna build a, a, a program that will give us uh, a 721. We're gonna deploy it. And then we are gonna look at uh, how it behaves, okay? So first you come here, you can give your tokens some name, okay? That's not necessary, but you can consider it the, the, the collection name, okay? So uh, how should we call it? Any suggestions for this one? Um, oh. We are doing an NFT, right? So yeah. uh, let's, let can we do one actually like, I, I think this is fantastic, by the way. Okay. Um, we, we don't have to call it NFT lecture, but let's, let's do this uh, smart contract for, 
let's say concert ticket. Okay. Right. Let's go up to concert. Concert ticket. Okay. Yeah. Concert ticket might be similar to an 1155, but imagine a concert ticket where the seats are fixed. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a concert next week. Okay. And then for that particular concert, uh, it will be like um, I don't know, 3rd of April. It's at 9 p.m. Uh, it's at a specific venue. And then there is there are 100 seats. Okay. And then we're going to print those seats. And then actually one seat is not equal to the other one. Okay. So there are, those 100 things are unique. They're very similar. They belong to a connection, collection, but then they are not uh, they are not the same so the seat uh, uh, the front row seat is not the same seat as the back seat okay so we're going to uh, uh, measure them uniquely and we're going to sell them uniquely okay so let's call this the concert ticket and let's call it the ctk the concert ticket this i'm just keeping it out for the moment but we'll need some place to store our uh, ticket information or um, pictures of uh, tickets if if they are all unique and that there's something uh, related to it. So imagine how, how does the ticket look like? Okay, so it's like, does it look like something? And you might wanna uh, put a picture of it somewhere. And that we're gonna uh, store uh, in a location. I'm gonna need that in a minute. For now, I'm just gonna uh, select URI storage, okay? So this means I'm gonna store some information about the ticket outside of the uh, of the smart contract and I'm gonna point to that. So for this, I will need this, okay? I can, uh, I can just make 100 tickets and that's it, okay? Uh, so I can say like, there will be only 100 tickets. I just mint them at the start of the smart contract or I can say like, oh, I might have to like mint new tickets. I don't know how many people are coming. So maybe 100, might be 120. As people are buying tickets, you can create them. So that's one way of doing it. So uh, also you can uh, count them one by one. So you can say like the first uh, ticket is number zero, the next ticket is number one. So you can, you can add some numbering here. That's also doable. So we might want to burn these tickets saying that like if somebody gives you their ticket, you remove it from circulation. It, we can do that one or we can say we'll just like get these tickets back and then we're going to reuse them okay it's up to you how you want to how you want to do it or you can even send the nfts to some unused address it's like a zero address and then uh if you just uh, move them there you can consider them burnt you can consider them unused up to you so very similar to real life situations do you just like burn your tickets do you just like break them do you just like shred them what do you do with your tickets? You can also reuse them. So I'm just leaving this out for the moment. It can be plausible, meaning uh, so the entire thing, uh, if there is an issue, you can stop trading. So sometimes we need that. Sometimes there are hacks. And when somebody is in trouble, they say like, oh, my, my tickets or my tokens were stolen. And you need to investigate that. And you say like all transactions have been stopped. This is a centralized thing. And uh, has its benefits. Some people don't like it, as I said, because it breaks decentralization. Somebody has that authority over the system, but it has its benefits. So some people use that. And then finally, um, there is this thing called votes. You can use NFTs for governance. So you can say like, oh, all these ticket holders have special uh, governance uh, mechanisms. They can decide what songs will be played in the concert. Okay, so you buy your tickets. And then each ticket is a vote, and then you can just go vote for the songs you want to hear in the concert, for example. So we do those types of things with NFTs as well. This is about it. So like not much, still a little complicated. And then I'm going to explain to you what this code does line by line, and then we're going to uh, deploy it and run it. So every Solidity code uh, starts with this. This is like you can consider it like a version, okay? So Solidity is a language that's constant evolving and then we have to know which uh, with which um, version you wrote this code otherwise it's not compliant and you say okay i'm writing this with 089 uh, version of uh, solidity so please consider this such and then uh, compile it prepare it with this in mind okay then as i said we have some ready libraries that makes your life easier so you don't have to write everything on your own and then the good thing is uh, these are standards. So if you do stuff uh, following these rules, anyone el else can use your NFTs. And then, the, for example, this will be compatible with OpenSea. 
you can sell your tickets on OpenSea. You don't have to build your marketplace. Or if somebody builds a really nice wallet that shows concert tickets, your NFTs will be visible there. Okay, that's the good part. And what are uh, those? So there is the first part, this uh, the NFT code, let's call it the NFT code, which uh, specifies this ERC721 specification. How does the NFT behave? How do we transfer it? Uh, we show that our NFT will have an additional portion, which we call the, the URI storage. So it will have another area uh, where it stores pictures and stuff like that. This entire contract will have an owner. So there is the, the minting future. So somebody has to mint it. Not everyone can mint it. So we decided to make our uh, tokens mintable. So somebody will have that. And finally, we have counters. Uh, we decided to number our NFTs starting from zero to uh, zero and about zero, one, two, three, four, five, and they're consecutive. We decided to do that. You could have done it like 1A, 7B, uh, balcony 1D, whatever, you could have done that, but then it's easier this way. So if it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you can count them, you can uh, sort them. So those are the benefits of using these numerical values. But if you want to use some other notation, um, uh, please go ahead, you can do it without having this uh, numbering thing. Okay, so that numbering, you can say I'm minting balcony 1D. Uh, and then you'll have like a collection of NFTs and it's your responsibility then to sort them and to, to figure out who has what, okay? Now, every smart contract has as a name, okay? So we just indicate it here. We say our concert tickets have the properties of these things that have been uh, included. This is called inheritance. So we are saying we have uh, a square, we have a shiny square. Our shiny square is a rectangle. Our shiny square is, is opaque. Our shiny square is shiny. So we just tell these things and we don't have to explicitly just like write them again and again. So we say shiny square, uh, immediately you realize, oh, it has four corners, okay, it's four edges. Uh, the edges have the same length and it's shiny, meaning like it has some shiny color to it. So uh, this is uh, object-oriented programming. And typically we do this type of thing. We just reuse code, uh, earlier written code, and this is the way to indicate it. So we have uh, the counters. So we'll be using this, uh, this counter code for uh, counting them one by one. And then we have a variable where we're gonna count uh, which NFT we are minting currently, zero, one, two, three, four. Then we have uh, the starting point of our code, which we call constructor. We just give it a name and a symbol. This is these are useful. So when you are displaying it in a, um, a marketplace, those that information will be used. Now here is the part where you prepare a token. Okay, so the only the owner can call this function. Okay, it is a public function, so it can be called by anyone. Uh, but as I said, only the owner uh, can do it. Uh, they can call it, but they will not be able to get something out of it. The owner can call it from anywhere. And then it gives two uh, values to this function. What is it? The, uh, the address where it will be delivered to, and then a, a URI, like a, like a web page a link where the picture will be stored, okay? And so it works the following. Determines which, the, which latest ticket was printed. Okay, let's say the 17 ticket was printed, okay? It increments it by one, makes it 18. Just prepares an NFT with number 18 gives it to the person, and that NFT will have uh, the web page link uh, to that um, asset, can be a picture or whatever, that's about it. So you, you prepare it, we call them minting, you give it to the person, and then you set its um, uh, pointer to a picture, so you'll have access to it later. So we can, we can burn it, we can remove it uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the, uh, the collection, okay? but then we do not expose it uh, to the outside. So I did not choose this. So any, uh, people cannot call this from, uh, uh, from the outside. So it says internal as well. And then there is the, the property of burning, but it's not accessible to the outside world. So we are not gonna use that property. Uh, so there is the token URI. If I ask you, uh, show me the picture of number 17, you're gonna return some link to me, like a web page link. Okay, and I'm gonna look at it and I'm gonna figure out the picture. This is how it's gonna look like, okay? And this is all the code you're gonna need. 
do you have questions about this one? So this is tricky if you're not a programmer, if you're not used to this, uh, but then this is all the code you'll need for mm -hmm. NFTs. They, yeah, so you can they, are, they are learning. I think this is great as well. Like we are almost seeing the kitchen of things, right? So Exactly, exactly. That's how um, we do stuff. I'm, I'm, I was wondering, so the underscore calls are basically um, private calls from the library yes. that we're importing? Yeah, so this is, this is a notation. So mm -hmm. when you look at code, when it, it has this underscore in front of it, it means it's internal. It will not be externally called. And we're like, oh, okay. So mm -hmm. we, we typically look at things that are public because they might there might be security concern. So it, as soon as I look at it, I realize, okay, this is internal, this is external, et cetera. So uh, this is a notation for that one. Not necessary, but it's practical. So where do we set the total number of counts? Like this is open ended, right? So this is open ended. So we so did if, not put if, a, put a, we could have put a uh, code here that would prevent uh, the number of uh, minting. So here, for example, I could have said uh, so I can just come in here and say like the total number of tickets is one thousand. Okay, mm -hmm. and then as I'm minting, I should just look at oh did I reach one thousand? If I reach one thousand, I would say like sorry I cannot mint. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm full. So this is how I would do it, like a counter, uh, like a variable here, maybe a constant uh, where you set 1,000 tickets. And over here, I would just stop minting if I reach 1,000. That's mm -hmm. how I would do that. And uh, okay. when, we, when we upload this to a blockchain, we get a smart contract a hash probably, and then we use it to... Yes, um, yes. Maybe, are we going to... Is it possible to see uh maybe something that looks like that as well like what yeah yeah, yeah. What so let's that? let's quickly do that if you don't have other questions mm -hmm. so here is the thing so you can open this in remix remix is a browser-based um, um compiler for smart contract it's very practical so i can i can recommend you using it i use it for lectures but also like in real life and i have to do something very quick i use remix Uh, we are going to use an NFT platform, but technically we can also do it uh, with our own custom uh, smart contracts probably, but we also embed the JavaScripts to the smart contract, right? So, uh, so here it is. So Solidity is, is the level where you are uh, at the blockchain level, okay? We are going to talk to that blockchain platform with JavaScript, okay? But we are not there yet. So with this, I can talk to, I can deliver my smart contract to Ethereum, to Polygon, or to Binance Smart Chain, Avalanche, whatever, okay? So first I have to build that program there. Once I have that ready, I'll be able to talk to this, okay? So here is the thing. So this is the code, the, the, the same code we have prepared. And here you have like few, few things you can click. It comes in here, it says compile your contract, which you do. And then if everything is fine, if you didn't like break something, if you didn't make mistakes, it will be compiled. And here you can see, so there is this little sign in front of that version. It says 8.9. It says 8.9 or better, actually. And then here I'm compiling with 8.18, okay? So the latest version available, which is fine. So it, can, it knows uh, which rules you have used. And once you're ready, these things pop up showing that you're ready to deploy your smart contract. How do you deploy it? You go to the next one. So this was compilation. And you go to the next one. You can either just immediately deploy it on your machine like this and then test it. So you can do a local test, okay, like this. So there are all the things you can do with your uh, smart contracts, all the things you can call. You can ask about its name, okay, so it will show you its name. So it's called concert ticket. Who is the owner? I'm the owner. This is my address. And then here you can see my address ends at C4. Uh, you can interact with the smart contract with this virtual machine on your uh, on your own to test things okay it's very practical but if i want to take it to to real life for example let me see if i have some test network are you guys comfortable with metamask do you know about it i don't think they have set up uh um crypto wallet yet, yet. but uh, yes. yeah yeah i okay. mean uh, okay. we, uh, and they're also learning JavaScript from the beginning, so I guess this this is this code is a bit too advanced for them. But at least yes. like we are seeing, 
um, kind of the uh, like background of things, you know. Exactly. I That's think how, really how things work. Extremely okay. valuable. Yeah. Yeah. So they might you might be interested in working with a smart contract programmer to do your stuff. But for basic things, uh, you should be able to just deploy your NFT. Should not be like really hard to do it. Right now, I'm logging into my uh, wallet and I'm going to talk about it a little mm -hmm. bit. We, um, I think for NFT platforms, you just synchronize your wallet and um, they they have built in the engine that automatically uh, uploads. Yes, the, yes. The generative but then artwork. in that in that case, you are using their smart contracts and you're becoming part of their work, okay? Mm -hmm. So there are benefits to that, but then at the same time, uh, if you're gonna do your own stuff, you would wanna do it uh, with your own smart contract. That's how all these collections, etc., do it, so okay? Te technically speaking, I could be doing a private collection yes. of NFT it's artwork one. of like, let's say 10 pieces, and I yes. could be deploying it on, a, uh, on, a, on my own, web browser with my own uh, minting service and then some people can buy it and they will visualize it on the browser, right? Exactly. So that's kind of exactly. the web technology so, we are looking at. Yeah, so we'll be able to do that. So here is the thing. Uh, so you come here. This is this little fox here is called MetaMask. It's a wallet. It's a browser extension. And the way that works is you go to uh, metamask.io, go to a web page, you install this extension, and then it will ask you for a few a uh, few information, some passwords and stuff. And it will also give you some uh, name, some words. Those words are used to recover this uh, this uh, wallet. So in case if you lose it, you can, you can recover that. And if you give it to someone else, they can also steal your stuff. So, so you have to be careful in keeping that information safe, but it's pretty useful. Uh, you have an address here. Okay, so this is, uh, we are using, right now I'm using the polygons testnet okay so there are lots of networks which you can use so there is ethereum which is a very famous smart contract platform there is polygon there is uh, avalanche binance smart chain and then there is something called moonbeam you can use any of those right now i just picked mumbai and the addresses here look like this so they start with 0x they're a little long like this and then if you give it to your friend uh, they can send you some uh, tokens so, and then you can also get some test tokens uh, from, from Polygon. The Polygon's token is called Metic. And then the way you do that is there is this concept of a uh, faucet. So we call them faucet. These are places where you can freely get some um, tokens for you to test the network. You don't have to pay for them. Uh, so what you do is you come here, you just give them your address and then they will give you, let's do this. Do this. And then you put in your address here. And then I'm on Mumbai. I say, please give me some tokens. And he says, okay, I'll be giving you some tokens. And then, okay. Okay, it says like, you already have enough. <laughs> so it says like, not no tokens for you, you have enough. But then if you use a, a, a address with not enough uh, tokens, you can get some, okay? This is how I got them as well, okay? So once you have this, you come here, and then from here, you just choose injected provider MetaMask, okay? You say, instead of doing like a local uh, deployment, I'm gonna deploy it to the test network uh, or like real network, and I'm gonna just use this MetaMask wallet for it. And then once I do that, my address becomes uh, visible here. My uh, metic amount is, becomes visible. When I say deploy, so I get uh, to my uh, uh, MetaMask and then it will ask me, or oh, do you allow this uh, interaction? Are you going to, uh, will you allow them to uh, uh, deploy this, this contract on the Polygon network? And then you say, yes, you pay a little bit of money, which we refer to as gas. So when I'm, uh, when I'm using MetaMask, uh, when I'm using Zoom, my bandwidth is usually allocated to Zoom. So things slow down really bad on my side. I, I guess I can pop in a question here while yes. we're doing this. Uh, I know uh, people are using their wallets, crypto wallets in El Salvador, for instance. So when you're doing yes. kind of a mundane daily 
transaction. Let's say I, I bought some groceries and I want to pay it on the counter. Uh, is there some sort of delay or like, because, because normally we pay on the desktop the small gas fee, but in order to make it go faster, we increase the gas fee, right? So that we get yes. priority. So um, this, would, this, this one is a contention uh, area. So everybody's trying to do something. And then the, the things we call blocks, they have limited space. So every few seconds, every 15 seconds, maybe like, I don't know, 100, 1000 transactions can be recorded. And everybody in the world is trying to use this platform. So the way we uh, arrange this, whoever pays most gets to uh, get into the train uh, first. And if you don't pay enough, you won't be able to catch the train. Maybe you can catch the next one. That's how it works. But then blockchains are very slow compared to our real life transactions. Our real life transactions, centralized transactions are very fast. Blockchains are very small and then they require some money, just like you can see here. So it says you're gonna deploy this uh, contract and it will cost you about a cent, okay? Polygon is very cheap. Uh, if this was Ethereum, maybe I would pay like $80 or something like that. So it's quite expensive. Uh, and then here I can adjust the, the speed by saying I'm going to pay more. Okay. So then uh, it says most likely your deployment will happen in uh, less than 15 seconds. Okay. So I don't know how, when, how long it will take. I just uh, notify the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the network that I'm going to do it. Okay. And then let's see what happened. Let me turn off my camera. Okay, sure. so the camera is taking up lots of bandwidth. Sure. No problem. Down. Okay, what is that? Maybe we have to enter a value uh, because we are sending it with zero. Maybe that's why it's kind oh, of- Oh no, that's the, that's when we want to send also uh, money. Mm -hmm. uh, we are just deploying right now a contract. So we are not uh, sending value as well. Okay, so okay. let me try this. I'm going to reconnect my wallet. Okay, hold on for a second. It might also be a server issue, right? Like, um... yeah, so uh, the, the Polygon testnet is not very stable. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, uh, as I said, like, I have to have uh, a decent connection. And then when I have Zoom, I lose some of my connection there.
let me deploy it to some other network. Okay, so let me deploy it to Ethereum's test network. Okay, it doesn't have to be. Um, So Ethereum's network is more stable. Okay. Maybe we reduce the amount. Yeah. This is a bit insufficient funds. There is the concept of um, optimization, okay? So deploying these contracts also costs money, yeah. Yeah. okay? So what you can do is like, you can optimize this uh, code, make it smaller. So you pay less gas deploying it. As I said, Ethereum is more expensive uh, using Ethereum. As I said, you might it might cost you like maybe $80 just to deploy this smart contract here. But uh, so if you optimize it, you pay less uh, money just deploying it, okay? See if I have a better wealthier account to use. That's not so you can see. So, uh, this is so it's not very cheap to deploy these things in, in Ethereum's case. One Ethereum is $1,800. So it will be like one fifth of it. So it will be like $200, $300 of uh, real deployment cost here. So you can see like how expensive uh, Ethereum is. Uh, maybe another one. Maybe. Okay, let's look at maybe Binance Smart Chain's test. Normally, depends where you deploy these things mm -hmm. uh, on, on like where you want to sell it, okay? So Ethereum is usually the uh, uh, the most widely used uh, network uh, for uh, NFTs. Avalanche is also okay. Polygon is is famous, but you can see it gives us like lots of trouble with the network. Mm -hmm. uh, with Binance Smart Chain, the biggest NFT uh, marketplace is Binance itself. Okay. And here you can see deploying would cost us around like $4. Okay, still not as cheap as Polygon, but not as expensive as, uh, as Ethereum. And then uh, it depends like who's gonna use it. Okay, so my contract with Binance Smart Chain Testnet was done. Okay, mm -hmm. now I can visit this. So okay, this here is, is my contract. Right? Yes, and here we have uh, a website called Binance Smart Chain Scan. Okay, and here we can access the, the code of it. Okay, with Ethereum, we have EtherScan, with Polygon, we have Polygon Scan. And if you want to further uh, show how the contract works, we can come here and verify our smart contract. And once we've done that, people will be able to see the code, people will be able to interact with it. Now, without going further, let me give you a, a concrete example, and then I will conclude this part. Awesome. Okay. So you know um, uh, the the monkeys, right? The board apes. I showed them. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I'm gonna show you something detailed about them. We're gonna approach the same problem uh, from from a different angle. So we've deployed our smart contract. Okay. 
So this is open C. Uh, yes. For those of stu uh, I mean for those of us who don't see this, uh, haven't seen this before, but of course I I know yeah. this. It's a marketplace for NFTs. Open market marketplace. You can also sync your wallet here, do transactions yes. here. So the you also get blue ticks here. <laughs> yes. You also get verified. So the these are basically some of the trending collections. Their floor prices. Floor price means basically the cheapest you can buy from one of those collections. Yeah. So here is a green monkey. Okay. So for <laughs> For sixty thousand dollars or more, like one hundred twenty thousand dollars. Okay, so if you come here, if you come to the details area, here you have the contract address. It's the same thing, okay, but this time it's on Ethereum, okay. So the same thing comes up the the, the contract area. I go to the contracts part, and then I can see the entire code. Okay, I can verify it. So there, are, it has all these methods. Okay, so. And then our monkey, what uh, this our monkey is numbered 7336. Okay, I come here, token URI 7336. Okay, I can ask the question. Okay, it says here is where you'll find the information about the monkey and its picture. Okay, so this one has an interesting uh, uh, catch to it. It's not stored in an uh, HTTP page, regular page. It's stored in IPFS, okay? Uh, I won't go into the details of this one, okay? But it's queried differently. So instead of typing like an address here, you find yourself an IPFS gateway, provide this information, and it returns the value to you. Let me show you one more, okay? This is a local uh, collection. Fluffy Polar? Bears awesome. by Selçuk Erdem, a Turkish artist. And I'm going to repeat this. I'm going to go to the, to the picture. I'm going to go to the details area. I, I find the smart contract. In the smart contract area, I ask the, the number of uh, contract. Oh, it's also an IPFS. Then IPFS. let me show you the IPFS part. Okay, they moved to IPFS. So with IPFS, you need a gateway. Okay. Um, let's find one. Let's see if this one is okay. Okay. This is like a URL shortener type of thing, but I'm you, can, just... you can think of it that way. Yes. Yeah. So instead of um, instead of uh, uh, typing something on the uh, on the uh, uh, browser, you mm -hmm. just give it to the gateway, and it finds this value for you. It can be anywhere. It can be moving around, but you just give it this value. You can use it... this one, and you get this response back, which is like some text, mm -hmm. which we call a JSON. So this JSON has its name, number, uh, also some properties, and also an image. image. Okay. So this one is stored in uh, stored in a uh, in a similar decentralized area, but it has a link. And if you click on this, so this one is now the pinata one. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can retrieve this. You see, so <laughs> instead of like doing the regular uh, HTTP thing, what I did was like I went to uh, to area, took this identifier, and I said like, please bring me the uh, the picture of the uh, polar bear. 
-hmm. okay? And I retrieved it. And then this can be moving around back and forth. And that's how you would do an NFT. So you would just deploy the smart contract the way we did that, okay? And then in each one, uh, so you do it like a mint. I just like jumped over these because of the time. So you would just mint to an address and then you will have all this information uh, uh, where you are gonna store the picture. And if you wanna store uh, like some more information about the polar bear, you can also store it here, mm -hmm. okay? So, so those, yes. those uh, zero to five traits, they, they basically, uh, they are basically how these images are customized. And yes. Um, when we change them, the image of the polar bear changes. And so it's it's not a JPEG stored on the web, basically. Oh, yeah, it actually is. So there, this, is? This, thing, this thing, the JPEG is stored. Okay? Oh, okay. okay. As well as the properties here. Okay. okay? okay. So but they... now they have stored it on IPFS, so it's mm -hmm. not changeable. So I cannot mm -hmm. simply, even the owner, whoever, cannot change these properties or the picture. So okay. I can sell this. I can just move it around but I will not be able to change properties of this one. They have been fixed, okay? Awesome. So, uh, but uh, then if you wanted to for the concert ticket, so you could use a picture, but you could also use this area for like, it's a balcony, 1B, it's a VIP ticket, it has popcorn next to it, stuff mm -hmm. like that. You could just put those things and you can just put like Sting concert, I don't know, like 3rd April, 2023, maybe, like venue, maybe stuff like that. Maybe the image could be a, a QR code. Yeah, that's just, also possible. Just Up just to, to get into the concert, right? You yeah, just yeah. like you 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 can show it on your or um maybe on the smart uh, on on the crypto wallet you can have also uh, a link to the yeah. QR code and show it to get yeah. into the concert. Uh, I mean th these things are all possible technologies. I think the possibilities are endless and it's very 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 exciting. Yeah. And then this is how we technically do it, okay? So there are some more details. But if you want to just play around with this, you can do your basic NFT collection. Mm -hmm. You can put in pictures, uh, so uh, you can you can do that one with open uh, with um, OpenSea. You can also create your own NFTs like one by one. But if you want to do these collections with these properties and then pictures, that's how we do them. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, if they're all JPEGs, basically they have to be listed, right? So it's kind of a, a little bit of manual labor, I presume? Yes, yes, it has to be done. Okay. So that's, it has to be because, generated first, yeah. and then you have to you have to list it. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the like my, the collections I made on a blockchain, they're all generative. So basically, all we need is a re, like the transaction hash, and it, it generates an output, and the, the attributes are stored. Yes. in that uh, as well so i think that's that the, there are advantages of t thinking about this generatively as well otherwise uh, when you upload a jpeg you have you also have to make sure that all the other attributes that go with it are consistent otherwise like there might be issues with the contract yes, yes. um so it's 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 a bit tricky like doing it this way but um um i mean i'm that's why i was excited to show the generative art uh in a way i think simplifies things as well yeah, so okay. generating the pictures, I guess, is harder than doing the smart contracts. So yeah. 10,000 pictures, how are you going to do them? Mm -hmm. so that's yeah. the hard part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now uh, that's the part I wanted to, do, to uh, present today. Okay, mm -hmm. so I have to take off. Uh, uh, I wish you like lots of success with the lecture. And then I'm sure it turns out to be great. And if you have other questions, things you want to ask me, you can reach me through Telegram. So my Telegram is the same, Tan Selkaya, that's my name. And then I'll be happy to answer your questions there. And then uh, briefly, I think in the coming next weeks, we are having our uh, introduction to cryptocurrencies course with Ismail Akupolat, and it's an online course. So you can also ask him permission to uh, join our courses there. Uh, so it's online, he might allow you. And we are doing these things in detail there. Okay, awesome. That that was that was great. I'm I'm I was really happy you showed all the background stuff as well. Um, I th I think it might still be a crash course for our students, but yeah, it was very it, fast. One it's, hour. it's also everything in one hour. It's extremely valuable for them to see that like everything we are doing, it's actually running on technology, uh, and um, like even just visualizing an image that's not stored on your desktop, that takes some sort of uh, you know technicality. So I think it, it was great to see how these things work. Um, okay. So. Uh, thank, thank you for joining us, Tan Sojam. Okay, you're welcome. It was, it was a pleasure me, uh, meeting you as well and as well as hearing. Same, same here. Okay, take care. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Bye-bye.